was called Letters to a Young Poet. In notebooks or on scraps of paper, she even scribbled down some verse of her own. Good night, sleep, and sweet repose. Wherever you lay your head, I hope you find your nose. Twelfth of April, 1955. Ed Murrow, a big star at CBS, invited himself round to the Greens. Would it be fair to say that uh, you got rather tired of playing the same kind of roles all the time and, and wanted to try something different? Well, Marilyn, now that you're a New Yorker, uh, how do you like this city, anyway? Oh, I love it. Everyone's very friendly, and it's a very optimistic, friendly yeah. city. Uh, Marilyn, tell me, what's the basic reason for this corporation? Primarily to contribute to help making good pictures. I, uh, it's not that I object to doing musicals, Comedy. In fact, I rather enjoy it, but I would like to do also dramatic ones, too. Dramatic roles. That was what Marilyn wanted. It was time to settle her accounts with the past. The seven-year itch, her last film made in Hollywood, was being released. A popular Broadway New York theater radiates glamour for the sneak preview of the Cinemascope version of The Seven-Year Itch and the birthday of its star... DiMaggio accompanied her to the premiere as if nothing had happened between them over the last six months. Who would have guessed, seeing her that night, that at the age of 29, she would soon be undergoing yet another abortion, a thirteenth perhaps, and that she would never have a child? That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> And yet she was so keen on having one that every three or four months she would convince herself that she was pregnant, putting on 14 or 15 pounds in order to convince those around her. She said, if I have a daughter she won't be any Norma Jean, and I know how I'll bring her up, without lies. Nobody will tell her lies about anything, not about Santa Claus or about how the world is full of noble and virtuous people all wanting to love and help each other. No, no lies. For the moment, Marilyn and Milton's company wasn't making them a penny, and it was Milton who was covering all the expenses. The suite at the San Regis Hotel, beauty products, clothes. Still concerned about her physical appearance, Marilyn was also becoming more and more preoccupied with perfecting her skills as an actress. With incredible modesty, she became a student again, enrolling at the actor's studio, run by the most famous and most controversial of all American theatre professors, Lee Strasberg, who was venerated at the time like the leader of some cult. Go to the actor studio on Tuesday and Friday, and on the other days I go to Lee Strasberg's private classes. He changed my life more than any other human being that I've met. Marilyn was soon to start shooting the film of The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier. Milton had bought the rights to the play. On the 3rd of February in the New York Plaza, Marilyn met Olivier. Marilyn Monroe Productions had placed the bar high. Olivier was a god of the classical tradition, a formidable tragedian. Paradoxically, he was a staunch opponent of the method style of acting which Strasbourg propounded and which henceforth inspired Marilyn. Strasbourg was almost like a therapist. He encouraged his actors to be introspective, being convinced that they would find the emotions they sought in their own personal history. To Olivier, the actor's studio was little more than a sect. But Marilyn and Milton were not yet worried about possible clashes with Olivier. Time would show that they should have been. On the 15th of February, while enjoying a weekend in the country, Marilyn posed for Milton. It was Amy who bought this sports top at the corner shop in the small Connecticut village.
The next day, Marilyn went happily back to the studio at 480 Lexington Avenue. Without makeup and in dark glasses, sometimes wearing an old overcoat or wrapped up in a scarf, she now knew how to get around without being recognized. The so-called Black Session, the most disturbing series of photographs ever taken by Milton Green. Each photo seems to be contradicted by the next. In one, Marilyn is tragic. In the next, she's clowning. Inaccessible and seductive by turn. Her poses evoke the pleasures of the flesh, but also the torments of the soul. This isn't my best angle, and of course, they got mad at the studio. <laughs> The Black Session owed a lot, perhaps, to Marilyn's troubled nights. She often spoke of the strange dreams she had. As a child, she often dreamt of walking naked in a church over the prostrate bodies of her friends or neighbors, trying hard to touch no one. She would hear voices screaming for help. Hands would tear her clothes and men would fall clutching at her as they did so. Arthur Miller would say, death was with her everywhere, all the time. She was forever dancing on the brink. Admiring a dream scene in white marble by Rodin, she immediately identified herself with a sensual young woman being held in the palm of God's hand. She was continually searching for perfection through works of art. Did she perhaps hope that she could one day embrace happiness without crushing it? On another occasion, she stared for a long time at Goya's demons. I know this man very well, she said. We have the same dreams. I've had dreams like that since I was a kid. As if for a lover's tryst, Marilyn met Milton and spent the whole night in his studio, shooting the second black session. Come on, more of that, more of that. Now give it to me, really give it to me. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> 